All right, once again, everyone, good morning. It's great to be with you today. If you didn't catch it, my name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church. We're one in ministry with St. John's uh, in Wash Park and enjoy uh, that partnership in ministry. Uh, but it's great to be with you. I had, a, I had a great week this week, obviously, as you probably could tell. Um, I've been out for a couple weeks, so it's exciting to be back here, um, you know, just off of celebrating the birth of baby Luke. And, um, you know, I do have to say, like, like, he's not even a week old yet, and he's already burned me pretty good. So, like, he's already way ahead of, of me here. I mean, like, so it's like three days past the due date. Like, I have, like, just fallen asleep, and then he decides he's going to come, right? Like, so, like, Megan wakes me up, and it's like, you know that feeling you've just fallen asleep, and you wake up, and you're like, I have no idea where I am, who I am, or, or what's going on. I'm like, is it night? Is it morning? I have no idea. Uh, but, you know, we uh, had, had, had a, a great delivery. I'm very grateful that everyone turned out uh, healthy and and, um, you know, very excited to uh, celebrate the gift of new life. Although we, we had our family in a good manageable spot where we were almost out of diapers and then we messed it up again. But, you know, uh, we'll enjoy it, I'm sure. Um, but absolutely, today is, is going to be a fun day uh, for me to get back into. I've been off for a couple weeks um, and excited today to go through Colossians 3 with you guys. We've been going through this Colossians uh, study, which has just so much to say uh, to us. Like even in this passage today, which spans 3, uh, 5 through 17, there is a ton of material. There's so much we can draw out of this and apply to our lives. And so I encourage you, uh, if you have your Bibles, to go there. Uh, if you have your Bible on your smartphone, you can go there as well. Um, just a, a great passage for today. And as we get started, I wanted to acknowledge, um, before we kind of launch into verse 5, um, that the baptism we witness today, uh, baptism is an amazing gift. And it's how the journey of faith begins. Um, many of us here as, as followers of Jesus can either remember our baptisms, or maybe if we can't remember them uh, because we were infants when they happened, uh, we know from our parents and for so on that we've received that gift. Uh, that baptism is an incredible gift. It's not a work of ours uh, to go, God, look how good we are. We finally acknowledge you, that you exist. Uh, but baptism is this amazing gift in which God comes to us with his word, uh, with his forgiveness, with his favor. He, he says, you are mine. You are in my family. Um, you know, you've received a physical birth. Now you've received a spiritual sort of rebirth uh, into God's kingdom. And that's an incredible blessing uh, that God gives to us. And it's a comfort because every time, if you want to know that for sure that God loves you, if you ever doubt that, as we all do at times, um, you know, even pastors, even uh, like we're all tempted to doubt. It's hard to sometimes speak God's promises over ourselves. We need others to speak into our lives. One of the things you can take to the bank, though, is that baptism, uh, in your baptism, God has said, I do love you. I, this is a means of grace in which I bestow to you the forgiveness that Jesus has won to the cross. And when you remember that, you remember how much God loves you. Um, so baptism is the start of this amazing journey of faith uh, that we're on. And um, in, in baptism, God ha has done something uh, really powerful in that he has justified us. Um, to be justified is to be made right before God. Because you see, we're all kind of, uh, you know, before, before God steps in, uh, we're all kind of prodigals. We're all sort of these people that maybe have spent some time away from the Father. Uh, but God is there with open arms welcoming us back. And in baptism, he, he takes us back. He desires uh, not for us to, to feel guilt or be estranged, but to be reconciled to God the Father. And baptism is, is the way, uh, the entrance into the church, the way that that happens. Um, and so in that way, we've been justified. We've been made right, put in a right relationship with God because of what his son Jesus has done, and he delivers that to us through baptism. Uh, once justified, we begin a journey in life known as sanctification, a uh, holification, a, a process in life through which, um, throughout the reading of God's word and immersion, 
immersion in biblical community, uh, we are being made more like God. Uh, we are being conformed more to the image of God uh, by putting off the old self and putting on the new self, by um, rejecting uh, the desires of the sinful nature and desiring to lean into the new nature that God has given us, which is renewed in his image. Um, and this is a struggle, a lifelong struggle, uh, and this struggle is known as sanctification. This passage today deals with sanctification, deals with this idea that we are to be regularly renewed and grow and change uh, to be more Christ-like throughout our lives. And so when in this passage, uh, in, uh, let's see here, verse 5, when, when it starts, when it launches into, here's all the things you should avoid. No that Paul here is, is not talking to unbelievers because uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't first approach unbelievers with, you've got to clean up your act. Uh, but rather, Scripture says, first and foremost, have a relationship with God. Get into a relationship with God. The, the, this stuff, the sanctification, it comes after that. And so speaking to believers, Paul is about to bring to us a number of ways in which we can more fully live in the life that God has intended for us to live. And so let's get into this here, uh, Colossians 3. Uh, we'll read 5 through 9 to start with here. Uh, Paul says, Therefore, put to death whatever is worldly in you, your sexual sin, perversion, passion, lust, greed, which is the same thing as worshiping wealth. It is because of these sins that God's anger comes on those who refuse to obey him. You used to live that kind of sinful life. Also get rid of ang your anger, hot tempers, hatred, cursing, your obscene language, and all similar sins. Don't lie to each other. So he's got this list of, this is just random examples that he has put together of, these are things that characterize uh, the sinful world. These are the things that characterize the sinful nature that's still in us, that's still kind of warring against the new nature that God has given us. These are the things that the sinful nature wants to do. Um, and often the sinful nature will convince us these things are helpful, uh, these things are, you know, fun, uh, and yet often these things bring us harm instead right? Uh, we know um, that, that sin is a way of kind of hooking us with, with some, some of this stuff. Um, sin has a few invisible hooks here. Uh, you ever use some of these? I've used some of these, um, you know, such as, well, I can do it just this once, right? I can kind of play with fire and I won't get burned, right? Um, I know how to avoid it, right? Um, no one will know about it, um, Everyone will know about it eventually, right? The things that we try and keep secret usually have a way of becoming known, right? Uh, we say, I deserve this. We have this big sense of pride and going, you know what? I deserve to do whatever this is, even if it's not ethical or moral way to get ahead or get what I want. I still kind of deserve it, right? So I'm going to make it happen. Or I can handle this, right? Uh, other people, they may not be able to handle this, so they should obey the rules. But me, I'm an exception, right? We, we kind of do play all these games in our heads of, of in the ways we kind of get into some of these sins in our lives. I, um, I once knew somebody who was convicted for embezzling a lot of money. Um, and with this person, with, what they said was, hey, it didn't start with, I'm going to embezzle a lot of money. <laughs> it started with, um, I could do it just this once. I could borrow some money, right? And then I'll pay it back. Uh, you know, you know, so I could just take a little here. Nobody will notice. Uh, but then after a while, it's like, well, nobody noticed. I'm going to do it again, right? I'm going to do it again and do it again. And, and eventually, uh, it just became, well, I'm, not, I'm just not going to give it back because nobody will notice. And then, yeah, obviously, somebody did notice, right? Sin has a way of sort of sneaking itself into our lives. Uh, and we think we can handle it. We think we're an exception to the rule, all these things. Uh, but we're, we're really not. Uh, and really, it has a way of grabbing us. We... Christianity sometimes gets a bad rap for uh, people think, oh, Christianity is about um, following rules and not having fun. On the contrary, in John 10, 10, Jesus meets, makes it clear. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. That God wants us uh, to put to death these things mentioned in this passage, uh, you know, not um, to, to have less fun or, or whatever else, but instead because God wants us to have true life everlasting life, real life. He wants us to live life to the full, the most full life you can have here. And so God wants us, he says, these things are, are, are consistent with the new nature that is in you through Christ. Um, toggle back to that past slide for a second here. Do you, you struggle? Um, one more, please. Thank you. Uh, do you struggle with any of these? Um, which ones do you struggle with? Which ones hit a little too close to home for you? Which ones do you maybe keep going back to and makes you feel 
a little guilty. Um, we all have our struggles, and our struggles are different from other people's struggles, but certainly this list has to hit home for us that, um, you know, we do have a little work to do, and that we do too often let the sinful nature um, get the better of us. However, Paul reminds us, we can jump ahead now to verse 10. He says, you've become a new person. Um, he says, you've gotten rid of the person you used to be and the life you used to be, and you've become a new person. The, this new person is continually renewed in knowledge to be like its creator. Um, Titus 3, 5 reminds us that the way we've become a new person is that Jesus saved us, not because of anything we've had, uh, anything we've done to gain his approval. Instead, because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing in which the Holy Spirit gives birth and renewal. That God has brought us salvation by grace as a gift because he loves us. He's created you in his image. And as much as we may have a lack of confidence in ourselves or get down about our own self-worth, God is really high on you. God thinks you are amazing because you are created in his image. He wants you to experience a life of joy. Uh, and so he brings us salvation by grace uh, in his son, Jesus. Uh, absolutely. Um, he reminds us, you've become a new person. You've, uh, and he says it in a number of different ways in Scripture, too. Um, he kind of says it like you, you have become a sort of a new Adam. This language is in Scripture of kind of the old Adam is the Adam that fell in sin, the man that, or woman that fell in sin, and that through baptism, through belief in Jesus, you've become a new person, a new man or woman, a new Adam uh, who has now a holy nature within you. Um, this Colossians passage, we could also translate a different way, which we have up on the screen, right, um, which uses language like this. Put off the old self, the old Adam, with all of its practices, with all of its desires to do things which are harmful to ourselves, and instead to put on the new self, the new Adam, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator, being renewed daily. Now, this is interesting. Often, who has heard this, that to be a Christian, you must be a science denier, or you must uh, maybe, you know, not have to think quite so much? Have anyone heard this idea? It's definitely out there, right? Um, because we chalk up a lot to faith, right? And we certainly do. However, this passage makes it clear um, we need to be renewed in knowledge, that a, the call to follow Jesus is actually a call to dig deeper into intellectually and philosophically into what God's Word says, into the truths of this world, um, to get your stuff in order. It's a, a call, in, in, instead of just to coast by, to get really intense about um, God's Word, God's truth, God's wisdom, and how we apply that in a broken world. It, it's a call to be more intellectually available uh, to follow Jesus. It's a challenge uh, even. And to be renewed regularly. We're going to get back to this idea of regular renewal. Uh, but know that that's a core and important piece of what it means uh, to follow Jesus. All right, let's keep going here um, at verse 11. Um, so Paul, he started off the passage today talking about a number of, of behaviors that we're called to put to death. And that put to death thing is an invitation. Uh, as much as it's a command, it's also an invitation to live life to the full, um, to get rid of those things which harm us. Um, verse 11, he kind of goes back to that idea. Um, he says, Here, here's kind of another thing that I want you to put to death, uh, factions. He says, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, uncivilized person, slave or free person. Instead, Christ is everything and in everything. Because in the community at the time, uh, the community that Paul is writing this letter to, there's a lot of factions. Uh, there's a lot of groups of people who've aligned themselves against other people, who think they're better than other people. And man, it's a good thing we've really evolved, and we don't have this problem today, right? All right, good. Um, we're, we're awake here. Uh, no, we absolutely have this problem today. And here's what Paul says to them at the time, right? He mentions a number of different people groups, right? Because the Greeks, they thought with their culture and their enlightenment, they were better than all these uncultured, uncivilized people out there, right? And the Jews thought, well, we have the line of Abraham. We're, we're better than others, right? And the, there was even a, a group that was trying to blend Christian practice with Jewish practice known as the Judaizers, who were trying to follow Jesus and the, uh, like, still do circumcision and, and 
it was just this weird thing that wasn't working. They're like, well, we have circumcision, right? And, and you've got people who are free who contrasted themselves against maybe those who were indentured servants or slaves. Um, but in reality, what Paul does in mentioning this list, he says, you know what? The Greek person, you can't trust in your, uh, you know, cultural enlightenment for salvation, right? To the Jew, you can't trust in Abraham's line. To the Judaizer, you cannot trust in circumcision. That does not save. To the, the freed person who looks down on those who are not free, uh, your freedom is not, uh, your civil freedom is not enough to guarantee you eternal freedom. Paul says here, let there not be factions, let there not be judging others based on social status or race or ethnicity. Uh, may there not be those sorts of things happening within the church. Here in the church, Paul says, things are to be different. Christ is everything and in everything. That all these divisions which do exist, um, that all, and we do have still divisions in our society, right? I mean, there are many divisions. You can even talk about gender as a division, right? They do exist. Um, it's not as if they don't. But instead, God says, in the church, we're not to align ourselves against others. In the church, we're not to think we're better than others. We're not to, to have our group and other people have their group. But instead, we are in Christ. We are unified in Christ uh, because of the cross. It brings together a group of people that might not have had anything else in common. The, the cross brings together a device, diverse group of people. Uh, to be one, to with one voice proclaim the one who has rescued us from sin, death, the devil, and instead appointed us to everlasting life. And so, absolutely, um, we have a God uh, who doesn't want us, if we have a faction, it's only to be one, and that's a faction of people who are united in professing Jesus and what he has done. And every good thing is found in Jesus. His name alone should be the name which identifies us and sets us apart. Absolutely just amazing what God has done. All right, so that's verse 11. Uh, going on here to verse 12. Now Paul's going to get into the stuff that we're supposed to put on, right? So he talked about all the stuff we're supposed to put off. Now we're going to be people who put some stuff on, right? You ever met somebody who's against a lot of things, but you're not really sure what they're for? Met those people, right? Or, you know, they have a problem with a lot of people. You don't really see them doing a lot of good. Well, that's not how we're called to be. Instead, uh, Paul here and God speaking through Paul is going to tell him, you know what, you're called to be a people who put on, who are for things, who are for taking care of humanity and all creation. You're to be a people who are for the gift of life. Um, you are for things. All right, so here's what he says we're to put on. He says, as holy people, which means set apart, whom God has chosen and loved, be sympathetic, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. Bear, put up with uh, each other and forgive each other if anyone has a complaint. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And above all, be loving. This ties everything together perfectly. Also let Christ's peace control you. God has called you into this peace by bringing you into one body. Be thankful. So he packs a ton into a short passage here, right? Um, it, it starts to, to, it looks and sounds a little bit like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, right? Uh, he's, he's talking about being sympathetic, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. And, and sometimes we confuse these things. Sometimes we think, oh, these things are weak things. These things are res reserved things. But it takes a great deal of strength and personal discipline uh, to be about these things, uh, to um, control ourselves, uh, our emotions, our speech in order to helpful to people at all times. These things are strong things. We're called to be a strong people, uh, not a weak people. He says, put up with each other. I love that. Put up with each other. Um, put up with each other and forgive each other if anyone has a complaint. How many of you have ever been in a long um, conflict with someone? Uh, or maybe, you, yeah, like everybody. Um, how many of you ever had a back and forth email chain that wasn't going the right way? <laughs> How many of you have ever been in a, a situation uh, where you just feel like you're just fighting with this other person and that you're so far apart? And then you get in, in the room to finally deal it out, you know, deal with it, or you get on the phone, right? Because uh, you, you got to talk or you got to go face to face. And then you find out like the other person like 
Like, it resolves so, so quickly and so well. And sometimes it doesn't go that way. But most of the time for me, when I'm in conflict with other people, I imagine them to be like this horrible person, right, who's doing all these things because they hate me, right? Um, and most of the times we blow that way out of proportion, right? Um, and, and the reality is that a lot of times um, people do want to live at peace with one another. And that's a great thing. That's a godly thing people are tapping into, that desire to live uh, at peace with one another. Uh, but sometimes it, it takes a little humility, right? It takes, you know, us taking that first step um, and, and just going, you know what, I'm going to be open and honest here about not just winning this argument or this email chain, but about acknowledging my part in it um, and acknowledging, hey, in, in the midst of this conflict, I do care about you. I do want to be at peace uh, with you. Um, th- instead, uh, sometimes this, this forgive each other Uh, If anyone has a complaint, that that requires some humility, that requires some leading. Uh, And that's something that the Holy Spirit thankfully does in our lives. Um, It helps us to be people who are open and honest and forgiving. Because we know that we need forgiveness too. If you're unwilling to forgive someone, uh, sometimes it means we really don't understand how much God has forgiven us of, how much he has done for us. Now it can also mean there's significant trauma that has to be worked through too, right? And we want to appreciate that. But... um, being people of God is to be people who lead, who are free with his forgiveness. He's given it to us in order to give it to others. Uh, he's made us the salt and light of the earth, and part of that means dispensing his gift of forgiveness. All right, and he says, be loving. Um, have Christ's peace control you. Um, don't be controlled by the, the sinful desires of the flesh, but be controlled by peace. Be a person of peace. Be as a person of peace in your workplace, in your neighborhood, wherever else, right? Uh, God has called you into this peace by bringing you into one body. Um, this almost sounds like uh, the faith, hope, and love from 1 Corinthians, right? Slightly different. Uh, but overall here, we get a great picture of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus and the things that we're called to be about. Uh, and these things, far from being weak things or sensitive things, are things that require of us great strength and challenge how we might normally want to act. Normally in conflict, my desire is to defend myself, but now our desire is to be open and honest and forgive. Um, The passage continues today. Let Christ's word with all its wisdom and riches live in you. Use psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to teach and instruct yourselves about God's kindness. Um, How are we going to be renewed? Right? So, Corinthians, or excuse me, Colossians 3.10. That's totally one of mine. Is it? it is one of mine. Um, that's right. We love kids in worship, by the way. Um, you know, we, we want to be a place uh, where we, we have kids in children's church, and if that's what parents feel they need on that particular Sunday, we have a great experience there. And in church as well, we love having kids in church because there's something formative about uh, being in here and experiencing worship um, in big church as well. So, uh, we love having kids in worship as well. And I'm not just saying that because it was my kid, right? Um, but in Colossians uh, 3.10, we're kind of skipping back for a second to get on this renewed thing again. Um, be continually renewed in the knowledge to be like your creator. Uh, how we are renewed is by God's word. By regularly uh, pouring ourselves into it, being immersed into it, uh, it shapes us, our hearts and minds, to be more God-like. Um, And when we surround ourselves uh, by other people who are on the same journey of faith, by other Christians who are also growing themselves, and we allow each other to to speak into each other's lives in helpful ways, that too helps us to grow. It helps us to be sharpened uh, as iron sharpens iron. The the more we're in community, the more we're in God's word, the more the things that we're blind to that are harming our lives, the dysfunctional things in our lives that maybe are poisoning our relationships or our ability to handle money uh, or our sexuality or, or whatever it is, the more we're in community and in God's word, the more we recognize those things. And the more we recognize maybe the grasp that those things have had on us, the addictions that we've had, and the, the ways in which through community, through God's word, we can receive grace and take positive steps uh, in the right direction. Our call is to be renewed. Our call is not to be the same. Um, I hope... I, I don't want to be the same person next month that I am today. I, I want to have grown. I think we probably all want to be people who grow, who are challenged. Um, you know, the call to follow Jesus is a call to change as we follow. 
Uh, it's not clean your act up first, uh, and then you can follow me. It's follow me, and then as you follow me, you know what we're going to do is we're going to work on some things. We're going to change, and we're going to grow so we can live life to the full, and we can help others experience that life to the full as well. Um, that's what it means to, to be renewed regularly. I mean, God's word, it needs to, you know, come and, and dwell in us. It needs to move into the neighborhood through you and through me. Um, may your house, may your apartment be a place of peace and of God's word in your neighborhood. Uh, may you, uh, in a sort of way, be the pastor on your neighborhood, a, a person of peace where people know they can go to get truth, to get love, um, to be served. May that be, be true of us as a people. And then we're getting close to the end here. Um, you know, it talks about here, um, use psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to teach and instruct yourselves about God's kindness. This is kind of cool um, because it, it's simultaneously talking about discipleship and worship at the same time. Uh, that this journey of faith that we're on is a journey to be discipled, uh, to uh, follow after Jesus and have our lives conform to his, and also to help others do the same. Uh, that we are the most healthy when we are using our gifts, not only to our growth, but also for the growth of others. And a great way that we do that is in life groups. Uh, life groups is a huge way in which we put people together, we open up God's word, uh, we do life together, and we sharpen one another. Uh, we even have a thing within life groups called trios, a time during life group gatherings when we kind of split off into some smaller groups of people that we trust, and we're open with each other about how we can support one another in growing. Uh, that's a huge way uh, that we believe God works in our community. I encourage you, if you're new, to check out a life group. Um, all of our life groups know to expect new people and to welcome new people into their communities. Uh, my life group has become like my family, um, you know. So uh, Jake uh, and Lita are close. We're close with them. Uh, Jake just baptized my child, and, and we started off in a life group together, right? And, and uh, there's so many people in this community that I could say um, I've gotten to know so well and consider like family, uh, because of the time that we've spent together uh, in, in our life group. Um, also here, so it talks about singing, and the importance of singing, and the importance of worship. That the idea that when we gather to sing songs and, and worship God, um, what those are designed to do is to help teach us, to instruct us, heart and mind, to follow after God more closely. Uh, there's, there's a song that says uh, that, that God, the, tune my heart to sing your praise. And there's something amazingly formative. When we sing the lyrics, um, God is sort of instructing us. God is shaping us to be people of worship, to be people uh, who have faith in what he has done uh, for us, uh, to, be, to be people who can remember things because we've sang them in church, but and to, to, to grow comfort from those lyrics, which are very scripture-based. When we worship, there's something powerful that happens. God is honored, and our hearts and minds are instructed as well. And then we get into our final verse for today, uh, 317. This is one maybe you've heard uh, pretty often. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So where we, when we started today was uh, all these things that we needed to put to death, and if you notice, many of the things in that list um, were actually thoughts and attitudes, which, uh, you know, when we allowed them room in our lives, they conceive and they give birth to sinful actions. Um, but Paul has told us to put on so much, to put on the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, uh, to put on the attitudes and the desires of Christ our Savior, who desires for us to be gentle and humble and people of peace, and people who make a difference in their world and in their city, people who love their neighbors. I figured out on my block, nobody knows anybody more than one house down because we're, we're a society that's forgot how to neighbor, uh, and that in loving our neighbors, we, we're do some, doing something very powerful. Colossians 3.17 here sums it up, right? So whatever we do, uh, may our faith cause us to be people who speak words of truth, to speak words of comfort and of joy, uh, to, to be good listeners, that when people open up to us in our lives, we don't uh, right away jump in with unsolicited advice. Uh, who, who's ever gotten unsolicited advice that was not welcome, <laughs> right? Uh, all of us, right? But to be people who listen well, um, to be people who can sympathize with others. When they, when they share hardships, I know I'm, I'm on a Facebook group, Facebook group where someone shared that they were having a problem like just eating unhealthy food. And, and there were people who jumped in like, oh, you shouldn't do that. 
Well, they know they're not supposed to do that. That's why they're being open about it, right? And instead, we honor that openness by saying, yeah, we understand that's a struggle, and, and we're here for you. And if we feel there's unsolicited advice that we need to give, we ask permission. We go, is there something that I could share with you that helped me that may help you, right? So we're people that in our words are the salt and light of the earth. We're people that in our deeds model Christ and, and the service that he has given to us. And no matter what we do, whether it's in our neighborhoods, it's in our vocations, it's in our groups of friends, wherever we are, whatever, whatever group we're in, um, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We can't help but give thanks because of all that God has done for us in our lives, all the, the, the ways in which he has worked in powerful ways, that even in the midst of hardship, we can still say with joy uh, that God has done so much for us uh, at the cross and each and every day. And that today and this week is a day to be renewed. And so I encourage you, if there was something on that initial list of put to death uh, that you don't like about yourself, that right there is a sign that the Holy Spirit is already working in you. The Holy Spirit is already at work in you uh, to, to help us, uh, to, to be honest, to receive God's for forgiveness, uh, but also to live fully as put on people, clothed in his righteousness, who desire to put on the behaviors and attitudes and actions and words of righteousness and to be God's people in this world. My heart is that this would be a church that makes a difference in our city, um, that makes a difference in our neighborhoods, uh, that this would be a, a, a community that you, you and I are a part of that will look back and go, like, that was one of the most important things that we did. I grew so much through that. And other people were served in the name of Jesus and pointed to him through that. He is our father with arms outstretched wide for us each and every day. Uh, he welcomes us back. Uh, each and every time we remember our baptism, we're renewed um, in, in that means of grace that he has given us. Uh, each and every time we open his word, we gather for community, we celebrate and proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. We pray.